maybe that's a, as good of place as any to, to dive into what I got this morning. So that was, uh, like I said earlier, this is kind of greatest hits of what we've seen in John thus far. So we've got the light coming into the world. That's very John 1, even John 8, Jesus referring to himself as light of the world. You have Jesus coming into the world not to judge or condemn, but to save. That's very John 3, right? If you remember correctly, uh, Jesus being sent by the Father. That's John 5. Jesus' unity with the Father. That's John 6. Yeah, and consequently, that to believe in him is to believe in the one who sent him. That is also John 8. Um, but, you know, also, it's also what we've talked about in our discussions amongst each other. So, like, Jesus is that God comes among us, that we don't always recognize him, that we don't always see him, that it requires the testimony of another to uh, help identify who this person is. Uh, we've even talked about uh, influence and the approval of others. Uh, and so there's lots of things that we could talk about here. And obviously, we've talked a lot about agency, sovereignty, and uh, all that is way above my pay grade. So I will not talk about that. Um, but the thing that kind of jumped out to me this week, and the thing that I've spent uh, most of this week reflecting on, uh, is verse 42, and these leaders who believe, but will not acknowledge Jesus for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue. And so this might not have anything to do with you, this might just be me speaking to myself, um, and that's fine. I, I like talking to myself. Um, but John, John says, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. I just think that's such a sharp critique. Such a stinging indictment. And I guess the reason why that sticks out to me is because my fear is that it could be said for me as well. Do I love praise from people more than I love praise from God? And that's a real question. You know, for one reason or another, I found myself in a bunch of conversations about APES. Or people are familiar with APES, right? Like I don't have to go through the typologies. We know we're good. Cool. Well, Ephesians 4. So in Ephesians 4, you get these, these five offices uh, of the church that God gives as gifts to his church for the building up of his church. Uh, and so there's the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers. And, you know, we at the underground, we believe in that. We agree with it. And we encourage people to, like, figure out their, you know, how has God gifted you? What, what office do you play or what role do you have in the church? Uh, but we're not like so crazy about it that we like organize around it like we know communities that do organize around it and that's just not us uh but it just feels like i've had lots of conversations recently about apex so we had calling lab in february we talked about apex our house church is going through ephesians we got to ephesians 4 we talked about apex uh in coaching conversations and in casual conversations it's just been everywhere and uh, and the way and, and get, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm a typology junkie. You want to talk Myers Briggs? You want to talk Enneagram? You want to talk Gallup Strengths? Like I'm all about it. Like let's do it. Uh, and even APES, I love it. I love knowing that stuff. I love helping people figure out what that means for them. What happens though in these conversations is that it's only a matter of time before people ask me, "What am I on the APES?" And I hate that question. Like first of all. Uh, because believe it or not, I don't actually like answering questions about myself. It's very awkward. I feel uncomfortable. I try to like deflect as much as possible. Uh, it just makes me uncomfortable. I have heart palpitations every time because it feels very vulnerable and personal, par partially because if I say something, uh, I, I just feel like that exposes something, right? Like uh, if somebody says, oh, I, I didn't see you that way. I don't think, I think you're wrong. It's like, well, then what is, what, how does, what does that do for me? Right. In my, in my assessment of myself. Um, and then well, what does my Ephesians four role typology mean for my role in our community? There's, there's all these questions that come up. And so usually after much disclaimers, uh, I say something along the lines of, I teach a lot in some form or fashion, but at my heart, my heart of hearts, I'm an evangelist. 
my writing, my speaking, my thinking, almost always finds its way back to the person of Jesus. How he is the fulfillment of what we most want and desire. Why he makes more sense than anything else we can find ourselves preoccupied by. Even in talking with you, like I don't, I don't have any other application aside from Jesus is better. That's it. That's all I got. Even the reason why I read and partially why I love to learn, yes, it's because I, I love to learn and I want to grow and it's how I interact with God and I want to help you. So there's a piece of that. But honestly, part of the reason why I read is because I, I want to be able to have meaningful spiritual conversations with people. I want to be able to look at your bookshelf and say, you read Into the Wild, I read Into the Wild. Let's talk about the human condition. You read The Great Gatsby, I read The Great Gatsby. Let's talk about excess and fame and celebrity and the emptiness of it all and fulfillment. I want to be able to have those conversations with people. I mean, even, uh, you know, we were talking about earlier, Timothy Keller passed away, uh, gosh, Friday, I believe that was. And I remember reading The Reason for God as a college student my senior year, at least the introduction of it, and having someone give me an answer to relativism and the idea of like what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me and there's no such thing as absolute truth. Like Timothy Keller gave me an answer to that. But the reason why I'm hesitant to call myself that these days as an evangelist is because one, I have no idea if I'm actually any good at it, so there's that piece of it. Uh, but then two, these days, I wonder if I'm too self-conscious to be an effective evangelist. You see, evangelism requires an element of foolishness and abandon. It's the willingness to take risks and go somewhere in our conversations we don't normally dare to go. To like see a wall of respectability, a line that we do not cross and say, I'm going for it anyway. You have to be willing to push past it. It requires an element of courage, if not disinterest and public perception about what people think about you. And I'm just not there, if I'm honest. I think about bumper stickers and flags that are draped in restaurants, outside of houses. And, and really what these are, we're surrounded by belief statements, actually. That's what those things are. Uh, whether it's police lives matter or trans lives matter, we parade and signal our convictions to the world so that no one has to wonder where we stand. And maybe if you're feeling, uh, I don't know, endeavorous, you can take on the conversation and begin dialogue. But unfortunately for me, all I see when I see certain flags or bumper stickers or whatever, certain demarcations where people sit, I think of all the associations that are wrapped in that. And I think, oh, they're not open to conversation. They're not open to Jesus. That conversation with Jesus is not welcomed here. And so then I wrestle with this question, what does evangelism look like in an age of dogmatism? How do you not just be one more voice clamoring to be heard in the societal shouting match that's going on? It's a missiological question. But my response, for better or for worse, has been to remain quiet. If everyone's shouting, I will not shout. I will try to live such a weird life, one characterized by kindness and generosity, humility and groundedness, that it sparks curiosity in the non-Christians that I know. <clears throat> but I wonder if at the heart of that, if I'm honest with myself, it's because I'm afraid. If I'm more concerned about praise from man than I am from God. And I could dress it up in missionary language. I could baptize it as strategy. But I wonder if at the end of the day, it's that. It's that I desire praise from man more than I desire praise from God. But if there's one thing that I want you to take away this morning is that if we delight in the praise of men more than the praise of God, we condemn the very people whose praise we're seeking and incur on both of us the judgment of the one who called us to them in the first place. If we delight in the praise of men more than the praise of God, we condemn the very people whose praise we're seeking and incur on both of us the judgment of the one who called us to them in the first place. We do both men and God a grave injustice. 
And so to bear your witness is to abdicate one of your key responsibilities in following Jesus. And here's the deal. If you are more afraid of public rejection than you are displeasing God, then you have a malformed view of both. And you will never make it far in ministry. You are dead in the water. That is how it goes. Do you delight in the praise of people more than you do the praise of God this morning? That's the question. You know, earlier this week I was talking with Lucas. We were doing a goal evaluations with staff. I didn't get permission to tell this story. Uh, I never do. Uh, Lucas at this point should just stop telling me stories when I have to get ready to speak someplace because I'm almost always going to use it. Uh, and I think maybe he even knows that a little bit and he's just trying to like slide something in there occasionally. Um, but anyway, uh, apparently Lucas has inadvertently started this microchurch underneath our nose, has said nothing about it. How, how unlike Lucas that he would do such a thing. Um, but uh, he uh, was telling me uh, about this soccer league that he started that's like with migrants and refugees from Latin America. And apparently since January, since January, we are in May, I think. Yes, May. Uh, they've been meeting since January twice a week. And uh, it's been a way to get to know each other. Right. And they've they've been getting to know each other. They have a WhatsApp group. Folks in the group are having children in the league, like does meal trains for people in the group. And uh, people are helping people counsel in their relationships and getting married and all this other stuff. This has been happening since January. And Lucas never once has said anything to anybody, at least as far as I know about it. And it's just happening. I think recently somebody gave their life to Jesus. And so now Lucas is like, yeah, now I got to think about discipleship. I'm like, you are a jerk, and you are terrible at communication. God help Jamie, uh, because this this is not cool. <laughs> Bree was like, I bet Jamie doesn't even know. <laughs> we meet every Monday as co-directors. We have family together with our di- or fa- dinners together as families regularly. We help lead the same house church in which we've had conversations about missional activities and coaching each other. And never once has this come up. Do you get the absurdity of what I'm saying right now? But apparently the story goes as such that like he has this group going and Lucas is trying to be very delicate in how he shares his faith. Right? Like naturally, like you're trying to build rapport with people. You're trying to get passports to be able to share the gospel meaningfully. Uh, but then he also, and Lucas being Lucas, is very efficiency minded. How do I like kill not just one bird, but like a whole flock of birds with one stone? Sorry, that's graphic. PETA, don't don't at me. Um, but anyway, so he's trying to think about this. And uh, he says, oh, well, you know what? I know a handful of churches who are also interested in doing microchurch stuff. And so he like reaches out to them and says, hey, like I, I got this outreach that's going on. If you got anybody in your church that's looking to be activated, this is a good space for them. They, they should come be a part of this. And uh, the churches, they take him up on it. And so Lucas is doing his thing, trying to be delicate, careful in how he goes about the situation. And I don't know if it's like the first gathering that these guys come to, but the pastors and his crew, they come and like immediately, almost immediately say, oh, this is Lucas. This is what he does. This is who he works for. This is what he believes. Like just completely expose the dude to this group of people that he's been trying very carefully to navigate. And it's like, oh my gosh, what have you done? Like I, you had one job, one job really, and you just cooked it. Uh, good job. Can you imagine? Uh, But then it turns out it's the best thing they could have done because now they're asking Lucas all these spiritual questions. They're like, I didn't know that. How'd you get into this kind of work? How did you arrive at this place? And they're asking him questions about what he believes. And it's given birth to this rich community all because somebody was brave enough to go there. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Charles Taylor. He wrote this massive book called A Secular Age. And the whole idea was that uh, we live in, of course, a secular age. That does, that's, wow, such a profound uh, statement to say it's called a secular age and we live in a secular age. But the idea isn't necessarily secular in the sacred secular sense, but in the idea, the sense that like all our ideas and all our beliefs are contested and contestable. This is what he says. So it's not that one faith has or one belief system is axiomatic and everybody believes this, but really all of it is up for grabs. We can all 
uh, we, we know people who are Christians. We know people who are atheists. We know people who are Buddhists and some people who, for whatever reason, are Wiccan. I, I don't get it, but hey, you are who you are. Um, and so the idea is that, uh, you know, it was tried to create a world or a society that was void of the transcendent, right? Like to say that, uh, you know, there's all these things. There's a way that we viewed God. We said, okay, well, if we could have a world or a society in which uh, maybe God is the explanation of everything, that we can have some sort of like neutral, objective uh, look at reality, that's, that's what we want. That's what secularism per- parades itself as. But the problem with secularism, Charles Taylor talks about, is that secularism fails to account for the messiness of life. So you can try to remove the transcendent and the eternal from the way that we understand our lives, but what, what you end up doing is that you end up still needing something, right? Because it's not just religion, but it's a thing that faith does to us, that does for us. And so what we create is what he calls these exclusive humanisms, uh, in which this is how you get people who say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. They have to create something that matches, that fills that void that religion and faith and Christian and belief in God uh, would somehow do for them. And this is the problem, isn't it? That God is still in pursuit of his people. And so as much as we've tried to create a world without God, transcendence came knocking all the same, still beckoning at the human heart. We, as Christians, we might be plagued by doubt. I think this is fascinating. Charles Taylor and James Smith, he uh, writes a, a book to follow up that, but he talks about how we as Christians, we might be plagued by doubt, but what's interesting is so are non-believers. They are also plagued by faith and are tempted towards it. C.S. Lewis talks about that. It's not that we are surrounded by unbelief and somehow we are a less religious society. We are maybe more religious than we've ever been, actually. It's just that we are surrounded by different ways of believing. And if we bury our light, we forfeit our role to guide the world back to its creator. And that's it, isn't it? That Jesus, he calls himself the light of the world, and he, and he calls his disciples lights of the world. And this is what we do. What is it that our flags and bumper stickers represent, if not a depiction of human flourishing, our ideas about human flourishing, whether that's political candidates, law enforcement, the flying spaghetti monster, which I've seen. I can't believe people still have flying spaghetti monster stickers in 2023, but it's there. Uh, The great outdoors. All these are claims that what we believe a flourishing world looks like. And for us, Our understanding of flourishing isn't found in anything other than the person of Jesus. It's the one who creates and sustains all life. And so we live in a world that's desperate for meaning. And this gives me hope because if actually you and I want the same thing, you want flourishing, I want flourishing, then actually you're open to a conversation about Jesus. We are people who walk in light and make light known in the darkness. And some may reject the message. But what's worse is to make sure that they never hear it in the first place because we're too afraid to give it to them. The police officer, the skeptic, and I, we aren't that different. We want flourishing, which is really to say we want the kingdom. And some may think it's found in freedom, but we know freedom is found in Jesus. Yeah, maybe I'll invite up the worship team. I'll uh, I'll call it. Yeah. You know, this morning. I'm reminded that there are some things that are greater than fear. You know, we can be motivated by a fear of what happens if we do something. We can be motivated by a fear of what happens if we don't do something. But there's something greater still, and I think that thing is love. You know, Bree and I, we, um, I don't know, I, I have many of you know that I try to 
the way that I try to be a fellow missionary amongst a community of missionaries is I try to do outreach at my gym. I, I go to a gym. I try to reach people there uh, with varying levels of success often. Um, and, you know, Bree somehow, uh, maybe because we've tried to be salt and light to that gym, uh, when Bree was you know, interested in coming back to the gym and trying to figure out what membership rates were, they were like generous enough to say, hey, like, actually, you both can come for the price of one membership. We, we need more people like you in our gym. And so really sort of uh, amazing, generous. And, uh, and so maybe because of that, it becomes even more puzzling to me sometimes when Bree's like, I don't want to go to the gym today. I want to go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. I'm like, are you serious? Like, you got a free membership to a gym. Why do we have to go for a walk? But anyway, uh, I've been married 10 years. And what I've learned in that 10 years of marriage is you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. And you got to know when to go on a walk with your wife. That's what I've learned. Um, and so it's part of our weekly routine that we go for a walk at our matures. And it's one of the spaces where we get to kind of catch up with each other. And the kids are occupied by things. and whatnot. And it's fascinating. This past time we went, we came up against this group of teenagers. I mean, I don't know. Part of the thing about getting older too is that everyone just looks younger to you. And so uh, I'm looking at them. I'm like, y'all can't be older than 12 or 13. Like, what are you even doing out? Like, do your parents know you're here? Do I have permission slips? Like, come on now. Um, And it's uh, two guys and two girls, boys and girls, and they're hanging out. And I remember how this goes, right? Like, I remember being a teenager. Like, you tell your parents, like, hey, so-and-so and I are going to the mall. Like, me and my best guy friend are going to the mall. And what that really means is we're going to the mall, but we're meeting up with so-and-so and her best girlfriend. And it's like a little double date without having to tell my parents I'm on a date. Like that, That's what you do. You coordinate these things. You have to be crafty. Uh, and so there's two guys, two girls. And like the second we pull up, like the girls are like touching each other weirdly and taking pictures and they're curled up with the guys and the guys posted up on railings and taking pictures with their girlfriends. And the whole thing is comical from the outside looking in because I'm like, you guys are 12. What are you doing? Um, Weird. But Bree's like, our kids are never allowed to go anywhere, period. Uh, They're not allowed to have friends. (laughs) Which I get. Our kids are not allowed to date until they're married. I've already decided that's, uh, that's how it goes. But we come back. We're like making our way back from the walk. And there's a point in which we see them again. Uh, but they're like at a curb waiting for what I think maybe they're waiting for someone either to get picked up or someone to get dropped off. And so a truck pulls up and it's like a, a girl and her dad. And I'm thinking, oh, like friends, more friends are joining the party. Uh, and so I don't pay any attention to it. Breathe like nudges me. He goes, those boys just took off. They took off running. And I'm like, oh, dad showed up. I get it. Oh, and I remember that part of the experience too. Like you tell your parents you're meeting up with these people and then you leave before parents show up. That way they can never suspect anything. They're none the wiser or whatever. But it was it was funny that these like guys that were so cool one minute were all of a sudden gone the next because dad showed up. Someone's dad showed up. They made like a banana and split. Um, But it made me think about my son and the circle of life. And how it is that one day those 13-year-old boys will be 30-year-old men who give birth to daughters who they try to protect from the very boys they once were how interesting that is and it made me think about my son and think about like man the day yeah you're not allowed to date till you're married but man when you do meet that person i want to raise you up to be someone who introduces yourself to her parents to not like be afraid or ashamed of that but to like say here i am and i and i like your daughter and i'm serious about her because at the end of the day isn't that what it is actually that like I, what it is, what I remember, I think about the, the, the parents I avoided, the, the dads I refused to meet. And what it was, it was, like if you were to ask me, tell me why, why did you avoid those parents? I would tell you it's because I'm afraid. And that's true. I was afraid. But what it actually was, underneath it all, was that I was not serious about her. 
as much as I thought I cared about that girl that I was interested in, I did not actually care all that much. Because if I was serious, I would have met her parents. If I was serious, that would have, that would have meant something to, to, to take that step. I would have wanted to do that because the second that I did actually meet somebody that I was serious about, I did it. I asked for her father, I asked her father for his daughter's hand in marriage which I was terrified to do, by the way. I almost chickened out of it. But that's what love does, isn't it? If you are more afraid than you are in love, you will never experience the fullness of what's on the other side. You are doomed to a life of what if. And to me, this is what love does. It fills us with courage. It is a shield about us. We are tougher than we were before. We can endure more, persevere longer, because we are both buoyed and embuoyed by something that's greater than ourselves. And to me, maybe this is the secret of, 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 of fear in a world of dogma, is to be more in love with Jesus than you are afraid of the world. To have him consume your vision So that everything else seems small in comparison and pale in comparison to his beauty and his grandeur. And when people see you, they wonder what you have. And the answer is Jesus. What if the antidote to our fear isn't courage? The antidote to our fear is love. This morning, Underground, I ask you, are you afraid or are you in love? Can you be more in love than you are afraid? So that's what I'm calling for this morning, for us to to focus on his face more than the waves, to listen to his voice more than anyone else's, to turn the totality of our affections onto him. And yes, the reality is that there are people who have resolved not to answer the call of the transcendent knocking on their door. But time is what it is. Jury isn't out just yet, so we cry out. Maybe the best way we can plead with God and man for their reconciliation and their reunification is by loving people, by loving Jesus deeply. I'm going to invite Lucas up to kind of lead our response for this morning as we come to the table. It is both a prayer and a recommitment that this is who we are and who we aspire to be. Intercession, boldness, that we would proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Underground this morning, I'm calling us to fall in love with Jesus again. Maybe like any evangelist would.